up on Dialogue Weekend. Pandemic declared, Wall Street in a bear market, and oil prices crashing. When will coronavirus run its course, and what more can be done to defeat it? In Afghanistan, a dispute over presidential election results and trouble for the U.S. withdrawal agreement are adding to the country's problems. And this week's newsmaker, Russian President Vladimir Putin, now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to this edition of Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xi Jinduo. As the coronavirus continues to rage around the world, the global economy is taking a hard hit. As uh, countries scramble to contain and mitigate the virus, their economies are grinding to a standstill. Are we going to see a recession? Are we doing enough to help ourselves? Joining me in the first part of the show via satellite are Mark Sloboda, a Moscow-based analyst on international affairs and security, and Anthony Chan in New York, former chief economist at J.P. Morgan. So welcome to our show, gentlemen. Uh, Anthony, so COVID-19 continues to sweep across the world, and its impact is increasingly being felt. Circuit breakers were triggered twice in the U.S. stock market as well as in other markets in just a week's time, temporarily pausing trading because of volatility. So what do you make of that? Well, I think that at this time, uh, this has been a, a real shock uh, for the U.S. Uh, economy. Uh, the good news is that the U.S. economy went in with a very strong head of steam going into this uh, potential virus. But I still think that uh, when all is said and done, the first uh, calendar quarter will be challenging. So will the second one. But if you look at the history of all these uh, pandemics or, or epidemics, uh, generally they last less than a year, uh, even dating back to the Spanish flu in 1918. So I think that in the second half of the year, the U.S. economy will be making some sort of a recovery. And in fact, we're going to get some help we certainly saw uh, announcements out of Washington suggesting that we will get some fiscal support and, more importantly, more money uh, to fight this uh, virus uh, on the health front. Mm -hmm. Mark, what's your point? So is it going to be a short one uh, and then we will recover uh, very rapidly? Is a V-shaped uh, you know, economic situation here? Well, a lot of that depends on exactly how much is damage done, both to populations uh, and to the economy. Uh, and they will feed each other as hysteria will feed the bloodbath, uh, both uh, on the local economic front, whether you're talking people shopping in stores and fighting each other over rolls of to toilet paper, or in you know the casino economy that, that occurs in, in Wall Street. And we've already seen wide fluctuations. And this uh, shock has already produced an even a second, possibly even greater shock by uh, creating an oil price war, at least providing the spark uh, that has set it off between Saudi Arabia and Russia when Russia uh, refused uh, uh, Saudi leading OPEC's demand uh, for um, uh, a cut in production as a uh, consequence of reduced Chinese demand because of the Chinese economy shutting down for coronavirus. Now there's a spiral rocket down to the bottom, so we're seeing two shocks at the same time, which is somewhat unprecedented. And uh, the experts are already predicting that as coronavirus makes its way around the world, and I think at this point containment is extremely unlikely. Um, it's going to affect some 60 to 70 percent of the world's population in this first wave, but there will be at least a second wave. This will probably become a seasonal flu and un until a, um, a large uh, portion of the uh, world's population builds up an immunity to it. We will see uh, perhaps smaller, but aftershocks into the future uh, as, as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Well, Anthony, do you share this uh, pessimism, you know, uh, from Mark and probably other people too? Uh, because the worst is yet to come in terms of a Corona uh, virus crisis. Let's say. In addition to that, you have a problem of the oil prices, and the tension between Saudi Arabia and Russia is continuing too. Well, I, I do share the, the view that uh, we do have a, an issue on oil prices, but you have to also remember 
that there are a lot of oil consuming nations around the world that will benefit from these lower prices. In the United States, it's not as clear because now we are producing more oil. But nonetheless, the consumer sector, which is being negatively impacted by this virus, will in fact benefit because with lower prices, that means that purchasing power of, of consumers, which are two thirds of the U.S. economy, will definitely benefit. Of course, the producers won't. I do agree that we will get a second wave. We may even get a third wave of this virus. But at the same time, uh, as I have studied all these uh, viruses dating back uh, to the 1900s, uh, I think most people would agree that the medical profession is more advanced. Uh, we have also accelerated uh, the testing phases and even human trials much faster than we've ever seen before. So that I think that by the time the second and third waves of these, uh, uh, this virus do, uh, occurs, we will have found a way to fight it. Uh, I know that a vaccine takes a long time, and in fact, during my lifetime, it would take normally about 10 to 15 years to develop a vaccine, but I think most people would agree it would be a lot faster this time. And in fact, we're making good progress on antivirals that will allow the, the population to live with this virus until we can get that vaccine in a year and a half or maybe even sooner than that. So I think that second and third waves will be uh, less severe because uh, the, we have, uh, at the same time that we have a, a virus uh, arms race, we also have a medical arms race. And I think that by the time the second and third wave come, the medical arms race will have caught up with this virus. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, President Trump has now declared a national emergency in the U.S., saying that $50 billion will be spent on fighting the virus. So the market seemed to have uh, responded positively. Uh, so, Anthony, how will that help the economy? I think it will have a very positive effect on the economy because the real concern was once you shut down this economy, we still have in the United States more than 25 million people that don't have health care. So we needed some sort of a safety net. We still have hourly workers that may lose their jobs because their businesses are shut down because of this. But again, now with the safety net, it will allow many of these uh, individuals uh, to continue living their lives and in fact it won't have as much of a negative impact and if you heard the, the words of the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin he said that even with all the things that the federal government is doing these are still early days or to use his words early innings in a baseball game that more can come if more is necessary so I am cautiously optimistic that yes the economy will be challenged, and yes, we can go into a recession, but even if we do, it won't be as challenging as your typical recession where unemployment rates go up by about 3%. I really don't think that we'll have that situation, primarily because now we have more of a safety net. And by the way, these are not, this is just not my view. This is the view of Wall Street. As you can see, Wall Street was encouraged. I'm not, sh I'm not sure that this will be enough, but it certainly is a first a good first step. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Mark, usually, uh, I mean, the, the economy will be somehow conditional on how long it takes the governments around the world to fight the virus, to contain the virus. So how do you compare the market to like 2007, 2008, the financial crisis? Um, well, I, again, uh, it, back to my earlier point, uh, we, we are facing, I think, multiple crises uh, at the same time uh, this time around. Uh, we've already talked about the oil price war, uh, but we've also, uh, in the last, uh, uh, you know, near decade since the last uh, global economic crisis, uh, spurred by uh, corrupt um, uh, buildup of a toxic debt uh, in the U.S. economy. We are, lessons were not learned from that first time around. And we've now, we're facing some $75 billion of corporate debt much higher than we did last time around in 2008 going into this new uh, you know recession possible crisis um, and um, 19 uh, uh, trillion of that is very possibly toxic debt all right this is uh, debt from the top largest eight economies uh, that is, is, is considered uh, extremely fragile, lent being uh, shadowy second tier institutions and so on. Uh, so that is, is, is poised to, to have an even greater 
uh, down effect on this potential crisis. And when you add in the, the, the cost of the domestic economy, of lives lost, people losing their jobs, hysteria, um, national borders are now being shut down across the world as whole countries go into lockdown. The oil price war on top of that and this looming debt crisis, uh, um, uh, a toxic debt coupling with that, of which, as before, the U.S. is the single biggest source of that. And we have all the potentials for a perfect storm here. Mm. Well, Anthony, focusing on the U.S., you know, the good point made by uh, Mark mentioning this corporate debt. Uh, because of the oil prices, which is depressing, and because of the corona crisis, and also the market, stock market is not that encouraging. How big uh, a blow uh, is it to this, say, for example, shale gas industry in the U.S.? Well, you got to take into account that this debt was a problem even before the coronavirus, mm -hmm. even before the beginning of the year. In fact, this has been a red flag for the U.S. economy for quite some time. If you look at non uh, financial corporate debt as a percentage of GDP is at high, very high levels. The only difference today is that when you look at that debt, you also have to look at it in the context of what interest rates are. And of course, central banks are tripping over each other to provide as much liquidity. Now, that doesn't mean that it solves the problem, but it certainly makes it more palatable. Uh, we know the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, panicked when we saw that uh, when the equity market dropped, that somehow long-term interest rates were rising, 10-year and 30-year Treasury rates were going up. The Federal Reserve is now embarking on a program to provide as much liquidity as it takes. In fact, they offered more liquidity than the banks actually uh, absorbed, and part of it is the, uh, uh, the legislation, that the Volcker rules and things like that, that don't allow the banks to absorb all that. But when the Treasury Secretary was asked, uh, he said that if regulations need to be changed, they will be changed to make sure that all the liquidity that is uh, necessary to provide a fully functioning financial market is made possible. I certainly do not disagree uh, that we have a corporate debt situation. My only point is that if you had that same problem and interest rates were much higher, it would be much more significant. And in an environment where we are pushing interest rates as low as possible, promoting as much liquidity. Even in Europe, uh, the European Central Bank did not lower interest rates, but guess what they're doing? They're going to provide as much liquidity and as much uh, loans as, as, po as they possibly can. The Bank of Korea is talking about a potential emergency meeting to provide more liquidity, lower interest rates. The fact that we're lowering rates allows emerging markets the, a little bit more flexibility to lower their rates. So uh, the problems are there, but we're uh, alleviating some of the potential impacts of those problems by keeping interest rates all over the world at such low levels. Uh, but I think there's a problem, you know, uh, of course, uh, the central banks in the European countries, in Britain, in the U.S., in China, uh, so they are trying to make it easier uh, to access to loans, probably at a cheaper rate, and also there's more liquidity in the market. But the problem is like with the coronavirus regime, you see people are staying at home. I mean, plants are being closed, stores are being closed. Uh, will that solve the problem? Well, the, re the reason why this is a multifaceted approach is because of exactly what you've said. We need to make sure that the reaction is not just the central bank. The central banks are just a small part of the equation. Uh, over the last couple, uh, a couple of days, I was encouraged when the People's Bank of China lowered reserve requirements. But you're absolutely right. That's not enough. You need a health uh, response also. And I think that when you start to do that in Korea, where they were uh, testing uh, a lot more people than uh, anything we see anywhere around the world, especially in the United States, that's a health care response. In the United States, when we're going to uh, promote more testing kits uh, to sort of ameliorate this health crisis, that's very important. When we provide monies for individuals so they don't uh, lose their houses because they can't pay their mortgages, and this virus eventually is going to go away. One of the things that really caught my attention is that financial markets are acting as though this, this virus is going to be with us for the next three, four, or five years, but the history of all these uh, pandemics suggests that it doesn't last that long. Even the Spanish uh, flu in 1918 lasted less than a year. The, uh, my mother was born uh, 
I was two years old when the Spanish flu hit. I was born when the uh, uh, Asian flu was uh, uh, real popular in 1957. Yes, the economies do slow down, but they don't slow down for five, for two, three, or four years. This shall pass. It has done so in the past, and now I think the medical response is going to be even more aggressive than, than it has been in the historical past. So you're absolutely right. Right now, there's a crisis, but the real question is, is this crisis going to be the same as it is now, mm -hmm. six months from now, a year from now? I don't think so. Well, that's right. Uh, good point. Thank you, Anthony. Well, let's uh, move our attention from the global economy to the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, with the U.S. is withdrawing from Afghanistan following a peace deal with the Taliban, two, peop uh, two people, actually different people, are sworn in as the president of the country. At the same time, the scheduled into Afghan talks between the Taliban and the Kabul government seemed to hit at the wall over a prisoner release. So after almost 20 years of fighting, what does the U.S. Uh, leave behind in Afghanistan? A peace deal and stability or a political mess with more violence in the making? So joining Mark and me from Kabul via satellite is Ahmad Shuja, and the Director of Peace and Reconciliation at the Afghan National Security Council. And via Skype, we have Wang Jian, Associate Professor at the Northwest University of China. So uh, Shuja, now we move uh, this, uh, you know, in Afghanistan, the next stage of this country. On Monday, we have Abdullah Abdullah sworn himself in as president minutes after Ashraf Ghani took the oath of office. So the row, or the dispute, uh, deepened on Wednesday with Ghani dissolving office of chief executive, which will used to be held by Abdullah, and Abdullah in turn dismissing Ghani's uh, decree as invalid. So there is a Chinese saying, you know, two tigers can't coexist in one mountain. Now we have two presidents in Afghanistan. What do you make of that? Well, thank you for the question. Let me first of all make a small correction. Uh, my old title was a Director for Peace and Reconciliation. My new title uh, is Director General for International Relations and Regional Cooperation. Thank you. Now, with that out of the way, let me come back to your question. Uh, first of all, Afghanistan is neither a mountain, nor is Abdullah and President Ashraf Ghani, nor are they tigers. Uh, however, <laughs> there's only one president in this country that has won the votes that has been certified by the Independent Election Commission as president, that has been sworn in by the Chief Justice of the Afghan Supreme Court in the presence of a vast multitude of Afghans, but also our international allies, including uh, uh, the Chinese ambassador, including other international uh, ambassadors, uh, NATO uh, representatives. So there's one president going on uh, right now in this country. There are no two presidents and no two tigers on this mountain, if I may add that uh, to the metaphor. Oh, but, right. but having said that, there is a real a political difference ongoing between President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah, and there are efforts underway to resolve those disputes uh, and those, those, those conflicts. To the extent that, that we are at the cusp of peace in this country, it is not because Afghanistan and the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan are not ready. It's because the other side, which is the Taliban sitting in Doha, far away from this country, from its people, from the difficulties that people face, because of the violence that they're perpetrating, they are not showing the flexibility they should be. So the ball is in their court. Mm -hmm. Well, Wang Jin, do you share uh, Shuja's view that uh, you know the power sharing problem is not a real problem? Uh, instead, it's the Taliban. Uh, actually, I think it's a problem for both Taliban and also the, the, the Afghanistan government. Because if we go back to the history, I mean, the, the go back to the time that before the deal was reached by the United States and uh, on the one hand and also the Taliban on the other hand. We have to know that for, for nearly two decades, uh, the Afghanistan government perceived the Taliban as, uh, as a kind of a terrorist group, as a kind of extremist group. But the Taliban on the other side perceived the Afghanistan government as uh, the puppet government of the United States. So that is why they make this thing so difficult to bring them together because there was a huge gap. I mean, Sometimes it's an unbridged gap. I mean, between the two sides, because the both of them, uh, the, I mean, do not recognize the legitimacy of each other. So that is why they make the things so so difficult. The first step forward is that 
both Afghanistan government have to recognize the legitimacy of the Taliban, while on the other hand, Taliban have to recognize the legitimacy of the Afghanistan central government. So that is why the only solution, I mean, will become the only precondition uh, for the future peace and the future stability that could bring the two camps, uh, uh, Taliban on the one hand, Afghanistan on the other, the government on the other hand, to bring them together. Mm -hmm. So right now, the thing is still difficult. So, so they need more efforts. Well, reconciliation is the key here. Uh, Mark, uh, we are seeing this divergence it has already appeared uh, as part of the deal. Uh, you know, Afghan uh, government is uh, uh, basically considered to be uh, releasing like a 50,000 uh, or 5,000 prisoners as asked by uh, Taliban. But obviously, the government is agreeing to 1,500 of them. So Taliban is rejecting uh, this, you know, small step concession, let's say. So uh, are we somehow, can we overcome uh, this problem? Yeah, that is not clear, and I, I hate to be the point of pessimism again, uh, but, you know, we, we've been near to this point before, and this was out, you know, without the uh, political divisions, which is essentially a constitutional crisis uh, in the U.S.-backed regime in Kabul. Um, the Taliban are a constant, and as both of these rival claims to the president uh, were swearing themselves in, um, there were explosions heard in the capital as the Taliban uh, launched their first uh, attack on the capital since the ceasefire, and explosions could be heard in, in, in the background. Uh, part of the whole problem here is that the, the, the constitution that let's have a little bit of blunt honesty here, was crafted for Afghanistan by the United States, created a quasi-monarchical system with a super, super president who is the head of all three branches of government. Um, and it's very hard for any credibility of any type of independent institution in Afghanistan uh, under this, um, uh, you know, uh, constitutional uh, problem. Um, and and uh, the so-called independent electoral commission and its, uh, you know, now repeated challenges uh, to its results as fraudulent as, as what has led us uh, once again to this crisis. Previously, it was solved uh, back in 2014 with the creative of this chief executive body, but it, it didn't provide any real power balance to offset this uh, super president. And it also concentrates power in Kabul in the hands of this president and doesn't make local officials throughout the country responsive to their own people, uh, which further leads to alienation of the population uh, and, and aids the resurgence of the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're looking at a real problem here, and we can see this uh, the last time uh, when the Soviet-backed uh, government um, was left in the 1980s, uh, early uh, 1990s, it also faced a division uh, in the face of a resurgent jihadist movement, uh, you know, at the time backed by the United States, okay. which would lead into uh, yeah. the, the, you know, the domination of the Taliban. Oh, We're a facing a divided Mark, uh, Afghan I have government a again Sorry, as the I want U.S. To have withdraws. A uh, Shuja, you know, you know, you are in Afghanistan, you're in Kabul. So what is the prospect uh, of the peace talks between the government and Taliban? So the, to go back to the earlier speaker, uh, to compare the current situation three decades on from what happened in the late 80s and early 90s is a facile historic comparison. There are very few, if any, superficial analogies between the two situations, so I would respectfully submit that in order for us to respect the complexities of both situations at their own historical context, not or avoid making facile comparisons uh, in, in whatsoever. So to come back to your question, the government has actually created a 15-member delegation for negotiations. That list has been made after consultation with all prominent political leaders, taking into consideration their feedback. The list has been shared with Dr. Abdullah, who is now the former chief executive of the country. He has offered his own input. The Afghan delegation is ready and prepared to engage in conversations and talks with the Taliban side.
Now, what is holding us back from the start of this Taliban side? Is it because the government does not want to speak to the Taliban? False. Is it because the government does not uh, does not have a team to engage with these converse, uh, with the Taliban in talks? False. Is it because the Taliban uh, the, the the Taliban does not want to engage in these peace talks because they keep coming up with these excuses about uh, uh, about their participation? That's exactly the reason why we are far away from this conversation. Now, you mentioned the prisoners' release. Uh, the U.S. deal with the Taliban uh, had certain provisions which do not bind the Afghan government whatsoever. There were provisions that the Taliban understood to mean the release of 5,000 prisoners. That is between the U.S. and the Taliban. But to show goodwill, the Afghan government said, fine, what we could do is instead of releasing 5,000 potential fighters onto the streets, which is irresponsible, it is a threat to the Afghan national security. It's also a threat to the security of our allies, the U.S. Oh and our right. partners, China so we have and to other countries stop in this there. region. Uh, Shuda, so thank thought, you. Uh, Shuda, uh, Ahmed Shuda from uh, Kabul, Afghanistan. Bank. So let's leave it there for now and take a look at this week's Newsmaker. Well, first uh, there was uh, the Constitution Amendment in Russia, and then there's uh, somehow change of mind uh, for President Putin in whether he's going to run and beyond 2024. So, Mark, uh, are we going to see Mr. Putin staying in power uh, beyond 2024? Do you think the Russian people will be uh, supportive of that idea? We do not know at this point. Um, what uh, Putin has done with uh, the, the, the what were uh, fairly sensible and, and needed constitutional reforms and this latest amendment from the Duma, which would kind of zero out Putin's presidencies to this date under the new uh, rules of the Constitution and allow him to run again, this is creating uh, room for maneuver. If there's one thing that Putin likes and has, has learned in, in, in his uh, nearly uh, two decades in power in one form or another in Russia, is he likes to uh, maximize uh, options, room for maneuver, and he likes to maximize his power uh, to uh, enact uh, uh, reforms um, and um, um, what he needs to do uh, within what is, is a, still a very fractious elite within the country. He doesn't have the dictatorial uh, authority that many people uh, think he does. He does have to deal with alternate power centers in the country, uh, whether they are the other parties in the Duma, uh, whether they are um, uh, state uh, oligarchs uh, that have a, a powerful influence or, or private industry. Um, so uh, Putin has created the option for him to run again, and that mm -hmm. is subject to a people's referendum, and then of course another election in 2024. But it's by no means certain that he will run again. Uh, he could uh, okay. uh, go back so, to being prime so minister. Let's have, he could let's have a one game. Head of the state council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Chinese scholar. What's your opinion of that? Uh, will President Putin run again? Uh, I think he will, but uh, what, what I have to stress here, I think that Putin is a very correct leader. He's a very, uh, I think he's the right choice for the Russia, because if you go back to the history the, before his presidency, I mean, in the tw early 2020s, what happens? Uh, I mean, at that, that the, uh, the time, we, we have to know that so the Russians actually, actually is, face a lot of internal problems economically, and Russia has already become the secondary a power in the world, and, and if we look at the political... Sorry, we we had the time world. is running out, uh, Wang Jin. Well, with yeah. that, we are coming to the end of uh, today's show. Many thanks to Mark uh, Siloboda, a Moscow-based analyst uh, and international affairs security, and Anthony Chang, former chief, chief economist at J.P. Morgan, uh, Ahmed Shuja the, the, from Afghanistan, international commentator, and uh, the uh, Wang Jin. Uh, you can watch us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm CGTN. Thank you for watching.